Hi, radio fans. Welcome to Behind the Mic from otrpodcast.com. I'm your host, Austin Vaughn, and on this podcast, we explore the history behind many of old-time radio's greatest performances. We jump around from series to series, picking one episode each week, and together we learn about the actors, producers, sponsors, and more before listening to that full episode as it was originally broadcast. If you have feedback for today's show or have a great idea for a future podcast, please send me an email at contact at otrpodcast.com. You can also send me a voice message by clicking the link in the show notes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave a comment down below. Today's episode will begin after a brief message from our sponsor. In 1946, CBS Radio debuted a new anthology series called Academy Award, which presented 30-minute adaptations of plays, novels, and films. Rather than always adapting Oscar-winning films, the series offered, quote, Hollywood's finest, the greatest picture plays, the great actors and actresses, techniques and skills, chosen from the honor roll of those who have won or been nominated for the famous Golden Oscar of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. With that as a guideline, any drama could be presented as long as the cast included at least one Oscar-nominated performer. The series began March 30th, 1946, with Betty Davis and Jezebel. On that first show, Jean Herschelt spoke as president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, welcoming E.R. Squibb and Sons, a pharmaceutical company that would later become part of Bristol Myers Squibb, as the program sponsor. The show was expensive to produce and cost the sponsor $4,000 a week for the movie stars and another $1,600 each week to pay the Academy of Motion Pictures for the use of their name in the show's title. This eventually became a factor in Squibb's decision to cancel the series after only 39 weeks. Today's episode is the 25th in the series and features an adaptation of Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, which was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Story and holds a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Joseph Cotton, one of the lead actors in that film, reprises his role of Charlie in this adaptation. The episode was originally broadcast on September 11th, 1946, The same day, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the visiting Cincinnati Reds played the longest scoreless tie in Major League Baseball history, going for 19 innings and 4 hours, 40 minutes, before the game was canceled because of darkness. Please enjoy Shadow of a Doubt from Academy Award. The House of Squibb presents Academy Award. Every week, Squibb brings you Hollywood's finest. The great picture plays, the great actors and actresses. Techniques and skills chosen from the honor roll of those who have won or been nominated for the famous Golden Oscar of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And now, E.R. Squibb and Sons, manufacturing chemist to the medical profession since 1858, bring you the distinguished actor Joseph Cotton, starring in Shadow of a Doubt with June Vincent. Mr. Cotton will play the famous role he created on the screen for Shadow of a Doubt, the picture which, as best original story of the year, was nominated for the 1943 Academy Award. This is the story of a weary traveler who had journeyed far, peered into the dark corners of life, and with the breath of phantoms on his neck, shook off pursuit for a few days and sought refuge in the only light-filled bit of the world he had saved to hide in, the placid home of his next of kin. Here, at least, he can relax, for here he is of the nobility, salt of the earth, the proverbial wealthy and mysterious Uncle Charlie. It wasn't the biggest yacht in the world, but it had a nice little fireplace in the library, and the bar was paneled in bleached mahogany. You pressed the button, and... (laughs) What am I talking about? All that's over. Let's talk about you, my beautiful niece and namesake, Charlie. That's the prettiest dress I ever saw. (laughs) I think so, too, Uncle Charlie. 
Charles, don't you remember? Remember? Remember what? Well, Uncle Charlie, you sent it to me. <laughs> I did? Don't you remember? Of course, I, I've grown. I had to sort of fix it. Oh, say, I've been forgetting something all this time. Here. I've been saving these under my chair. For you, Joe, a little present. Oh, oh you yeah. didn't have to think of me, Charles. Oh. <laughs> Presents are all right for the children. <whistles> Ooh, look at this beautiful wristwatch. Say, fellas at the bank will think I'm quite a sport. Huh? Oh, Charles. <laughs> Charles, how beautiful. Silver foxes for you, Emmy. Oh, oh I, I've wanted one all my life. Oh, Charles, you are the kindest brother in the world. Oh, nonsense, oh. Emmy. I can afford it. I get more pleasure out of giving than receiving. And now, these, Emmy. These miniatures of our mother and father. Charles, did you have these all along? All along. Oh. All these years I've been away, safe in a deposit box, stored away safe, no matter where I was. Grandpa and Grandma? Mm. Yes. 1888, 58 years ago. My, she was pretty, and, and he is sweet. Everyone was pretty and sweet then, Charlie. The whole world, a wonderful world. Not like the world today. It was great to be young then. But we're happy now, Uncle Charlie. Look at us. For once, we're, we're all happy at the same time. And now, yes. for your little present, Charlie. No, no, I don't want anything. Right now, I have enough. Before you came, I, I didn't think I had anything, but now, now I don't want another thing. No, what could be the matter with her? Oh, she's all right, just excited. I'll go into the kitchen with her. She'll like this when she sees it. <laughs> yes, I'll say. Why did you follow me? I meant it. Please don't give me anything, Uncle Charlie. Nothing? I, I can't explain. You came here, and Mother's happy, and, and I'm glad she named me after you and that she thinks we're both alike. I think we are, too. I know it. It would spoil things if you gave me anything. <laughs> You're a strange girl, Charlie. Why would it spoil things? Because we're, we're not just an uncle and a niece. There's something else. I know you. I know that, that you don't tell people a lot of things. I don't either. I have a feeling that inside you somewhere, there's something... something nobody knows. Something nobody knows? Something secret and wonderful and... Well, I'll find out. Well, it's not good to find out too much, Charlie. But but we're kind of like twins, don't you see? We we have to know. Give me a hand. No, no, the, the other finger. Now. Thank you. But you haven't even looked at the ring. I don't have to look at it. No matter what you gave me, it'd be the same. <laughs> Here, now, let me show it to you. It's a good emerald. A really good one. And good emeralds are the most beautiful things in the world. Well, well, you've had something engraved on it. I haven't, but I will if you'd like me to. But you have, Uncle Charlie. You have it. It's very faint. It, it, it's way down under the stone. T.S. from... from B.M. Well, that must be someone's initial. The jeweler rooked me. The jeweler rooked oh, me. Oh, it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't. He rooked me this second hand. He rooked me. The whole world is crooked. The whole rotten But I like world. it this way. Someone else was probably happy with this. Oh, rotten. It's not rotten. Not where you and I are... and, and mother and... And the rest of it. Here. Give it back to me. I'll have that taken off. No. No, it's perfect the way it is. Now, you bring the coffee and, and we'll surprise them with perfect service. Well, Charles, you just sit here and relax. Oh, thank you, Emmy. It's wonderful to be comfortable again. There's the evening paper. Yeah. Make yourself comfy. Joe's gone to bed. Didn't he read it? No, he was too tired from all the excitement of you and the presents and everything. Oh, hard. None of us have even had a chance to even peek at the news. <laughs> Lordy, I'm tuckered up, too. You go on to bed, Emmy. I just want to sit here and smoke and read and soak up the feeling of home. Oh, it's wonderful seeing you here, relaxed, <laughs> home with your own... Well, good night, Charles. Good night, Emmy. Uncle Charlie. Oh, oh, uh, hello. What's the matter? <laughs> Nothing. I just saw something in the paper that interested me, so I tore it out. Oh. Well, um, I brought you a pitcher of cold water. Mom said you wanted it. Oh, thank you, Charlie. You're very thoughtful. Sweet dreams. Uncle Charlie. Oh. I know something. I know a secret that you don't think I know. What secret? I know that there was something in that evening paper about you. About me? In the evening paper? About you. Please show it to me. I won't tell us so. Oh, Charlie, you have me. 
But it wasn't about me. It was about some people I used to know. Well, let me see. There, now I've got the clipping and I'll prove it. Oh, you, oh, give me that. It's none of your business. Uncle Charlie, you're hurting me. Your hand. Oh, Charlie. I... Well, I didn't mean to. It. I, I must have grabbed you harder than I thought. I, 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 was, I was just fooling about it. It was just some gossip, not too pretty, about someone I met up with once. Nothing for you to read. You forget it. I, I am sorry, Uncle Charlie. I was only trying to tease you. I know. <laughs> I know. Good night, Uncle Charlie. Good night. Good night. And pleasant dreams. Good morning, Emmy. I can't face the world without some hot coffee. Well, I don't mind coddling you your first morning. While you've been sleeping, the whole town's talking about you. About me? About you. The telephone's never stopped. Everybody wants to meet my favorite brother. Where's young Charlie? Oh, she's buzzing around the house as though she'd lost her mind. You see, you're not the only celebrity in town. The whole Newton family's going to be in the limelight. <laughs> what are you all up to? Well, a young man came here this morning. Said his name was Graham. He wants to interview everybody in the house. Interview everybody? Yes, it's, it's kind of poor. It's called the National Public Survey. How did he happen to pick this family? He wanted a typical American family. Uh, when do I happen to come here? <laughs> That's what I asked him. What'd he say? Oh, he said they looked around all over and finally decided on us. Well, if he's going to ask a lot of questions, he can leave me out of it. Why, you have more to tell than any of us. He's going to take our pictures, too. Pictures? Yes. You see, there were really two young men. One takes the pictures. Oh, there were two of them. Yes. Very, very nice young men. One of them was really very handsome. Well, Charles, it certainly looks like the Newtons are going to be real famous. Emmy, where's young Charlie? Oh, she went off someplace, Charles. I think she's having a sandwich down the corner with one of the young men who was here today taking pictures. Mercy, they were particular. I bet I had to break two dozen eggs in mixing that cake so they could get just the right picture. Uh, why did she go with that young man? Well, to tell the truth, Charles, I... I think she's peeved at you. Oh, really? Why? Well, she said that when they were taking pictures of the upstairs today, one of them happened to take your picture as you came up the stairs, and you made him give you the film. So I did. Uh... Invasion of privacy, my dear. I, I won't tolerate such goings-on. How do we know what those young men would do with those pictures? Mercy me, Charles. I'm sure I don't know. But you're so much smarter than we are. If you say they can't take pictures, well, they just can't, that's uh, I all. I don't like young Charlie talking to those men. There's, there's something about them I don't quite like. I, I'll have to have a talk with her when she gets back. Tell her I want to see her, Amy. I want to see her the minute she comes in. <laughs> I know now, Jack Graham, what you really are. You're a detective. There's something the matter, and you're a detective. Charlie, listen. I don't want to listen. You pretended to be making a survey. You fooled us all. You've got to listen. You've got to trust me. Why should I when you lied to me? I had to. You've just got to believe. We came here to find a man. I hadn't counted on your mother and your family. Find a man? What man? There's a man loose in this country. We're after him. We don't know much about him. We, we don't even know what he looks like. Charlie, think. How much do you know about your uncle? Well, he's my uncle. He, he's my mother's brother. What has he done? I can't tell you what he's done. We're after one man. Your uncle may be that man. We've followed him. We think he is. But in the East, there's another man who's being hunted, too. Hunted through Massachusetts and into Maine. He may be the man. Uncle Charles hasn't done anything. He knows it would kill my mother if he'd done anything. Oh, why don't you arrest that man in Maine? Why don't you go away and leave us alone? Oh, Charlie, when we were eating tonight talking about your folks and mine, what we'd done and how we felt. We were like two ordinary people, weren't we? You liked me, I know you did. And I liked you. That doesn't matter now. It does matter. But if it is your uncle, Charlie, I'm going to catch up with him. And you've got to keep your mouth shut. Because you're an honest girl and you know you'll help me. I wouldn't help you, I... Please, please, Charlie. If your uncle Charlie's the man we want, we'll get him out of town quietly. We won't arrest him here. You see... 
I like you, Charlie. All right, I, I won't say anything, but, but I'm going to prove you're wrong. I'm going to prove it right now. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Newton. Hold on there, young lady. Wait for the light. I'm sorry, officer. I'm, I'm trying to get to the library before nine o'clock. All right, now. Mind your step and go ahead. Really, Charlie, you know as well as I do that this library closes at nine. I'm terribly sorry, Miss Cochran, but there, there's something in a newspaper I've got to say. Yeah, since you're in, you're in. You have just two minutes. Oh, oh please make it be here. Make it be as Uncle Charlie says about, about somebody else. Oh. Boston, February 8th. Search for the, the Mary Widow murderer continues. No photograph of the suspected man has ever been obtained. His victims have, have uniformly been widows of large means, living in, in resort hotels, and, and this fact has led to his being called a merry widow murderer. His last victim was, was Mrs. Byron Mansfield, the former Thelma Scott. The ring. T.S. Time to go, Charlie. Now, please, I'm tired after a hard day on my feet. All right. All right, then. Thank you. No. No. Not my uncle, Charlie. Not... I've been waiting for you, Charlie. Waiting and waiting and waiting. Come, child. No. No. Come and take me by the hand. Soft and dark. And the moon is set. And honest people turn down their lamps and make ready for the night. note of mystery is fine in a drama, but when it comes to choosing a dentifrice, well, then you want to know what to expect. That's why so many people choose Squibb Dental Cream. They know you can taste, feel, and see the refreshing difference. And there's no mystery why. 223 scientific tests behind every tube ensure those distinctive qualities that make Squibb Dental Cream such a pleasure to use. Testing guarantees its mint frosted tingle. Refreshing as the crisp, sparkling sunlight of an autumn day. Invigorating as the tang of wood smoke in the air. Testing guarantees the brisk action of Squib Dental Cream that leaves your whole mouth feeling so wonderfully clean. And testing guarantees that the polishing agent in Squib Dental Cream, one of the safest, most effective known to dental science, will help to bring out all the natural sparkle of your smile. So, for your own protection, for greater refreshment, use Squib Dental Cream one of the great family of Squibb products. Taste, feel, and see the refreshing difference. In just a moment, you will hear part two of Shadow of a Doubt. But first, we wish to thank Universal International Pictures for making this story available. They are also the producers of Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. <laughs> And now, the House of Squibb presents part two of Academy Awards, starring Joseph Cotton in Shadow of a Doubt with June Vincent. So, you think you found me out, you and your young friend, Graham? I don't know. I'm not going to tell him what I know. He may find out, but, but I won't tell him. He won't find out. I'm only asking you one thing. Just go away and leave us alone. No. Charlie, will you help me? Help you? Charlie, the same blood flows through our veins. 
A week ago, I was at the end of my rope. I'm so tired, Charlie. There's an end to the amount of running a man can do. And this is my last chance. Give it to me. There's another man in the East. They suspect him, too, if they catch him. Give me this one last chance, Charlie. Take your... your chance and go. No, I'll go. I'll go, Charlie. If you'll just give me a couple of days, help me, Charlie. I'm... I'm your uncle. Think of your mother. It would kill your mother. Yes, it would kill my mother. It would kill you, too, wouldn't it, Uncle Charlie? Now, go on. Get away from here. You can have your few days. Do you realize what it means if they get me? The electric chair. I count on you. Don't forget you said it yourself. We are not any ordinary uncle and niece. Now, no matter what I've done, we are twins. Go in now. And sleep. Sleep and pleasant dreams, beautiful Charlie. <laughs> Let's go in the garage. I've got to talk to you. Yes, Jack. I don't know how it happened, but it did. They tracked down the other man. In, in trying to run away at the airport in Boston, he backed into the propeller of a plane that was warming up. Well, the heat's off your uncle. I knew you'd have to go away, but, but I hadn't thought about it. I'll be alone again. I'll be back, Charlie, as soon as I can make it. You're not frightened now, are you, Charlie? No. I love you. Do you, Jack? That's why I'm coming back. I'll be here, waiting. Well, what have you two been locking yourselves in the garage for? When I was young, we sat in the parlor. Hello. <laughs> oh, I, I was saying goodbye to Charlie. In the garage? In the garage. The door got stuck. Now I'll have to say goodbye to you. Well, say goodbye to me on the lawn. No use taking chances on that garage door again. Finished here? All finished. But I'll be back. You'll be seeing me around. Oh, not on business. Oh, I see. Well, Charlie's a fine girl. She's the thing I love most in the world. Have a good trip, Mr. Graham. And uh, <laughs> don't take any more pictures without permission. Rights of man, you know. Uh, freedom. We'll have a talk about freedom someday, Mr. Oakley. I'll be running along now. I'd better say goodbye to your mother, Charlie. You coming, sir? Oh, no, no. I'd better see if I can fix that garage door. <laughs> Well, folks, before we go to the women's club this evening, I'm going to tell you what I intend to say. I've been doing a lot of thinking, and I've come to a lot of conclusions. There's another thing I'd like to do, and I'm going to ask you, to Emmett, to help me. I'd like to do something for the town here. Something for the children's hospital. Oh, Charles. Something in memory of our father and mother. Something fine and good. By George. That's wonderful of you, Charles. Oh, Charles, I know how you feel about children who've been hurt... Because you were so terribly hurt yourself once. It's a miracle you're all right now. You might have been crippled for life. I know. I know how you feel about children. Well, sir, this is the finest thing I ever heard of. Wait till you hear about this tonight. We'd better be going. Mercy, where are we all going to sit? Mother, Mother, Uncle Charles can sit in the back with Papa, and, and Roger and Ann will fit in perfectly well beside them. Oh, nonsense. I'm getting a cab. You all go in the cab, and Charlie and I will... Go in the other car alone. No, no, you go in the taxi, Uncle Charlie. Uh, no, no, I know what I'm doing now. There's the cab waiting. You go get the car in the garage, Charlie. I'll wait for you. Mother, Mother, please ride with me. Papa can take the children, please. Well, get the car. We'll figure it out when we get out in the street. All right. Well, I guess we might as well sit down and wait till Charlie drives around. <laughs> the more I see that girl, the more I seem to love her. I wonder what's keeping Charlie. Yeah, she's been gone 15 minutes. What in the world could have happened? What is it? You better all come quick. I heard someone screaming and pounding on your garage door. There's fumes coming out. I think it's Charlie. Okay. Keep back, everybody. Keep back, Joe. Here. Here, I'll put her on the grass. Now get that flask of whiskey out of my room, Joe. Run. Charlie. Charlie, dear Charlie. Belly, speak. Charlie, Charlie, speak to me. Get away, Uncle Charlie. 
get away. Uh, she wants you, Emmy. I'm here, my darling. Mother is here. I- I'm all right. Just, just let me out. Here. Here. There. there you are, Charlie. You've had a wonder- wonderful escape, dear. Someone must have left the engine running. Or, or did you start the car yourself? The ignition key was gone and the engine was running. And the garage doors were jammed. Oh, now, that sounds impossible, but it must be the carbon monoxide fumes clouding her brain. I'll, I'll be all right. I just want to be alone. You all go ahead to the meeting. I should say I not. want you to. I'll stay in the porch and then I'll get the things ready for the party when you get back. Oh, I don't feel much like making a speech when, when I think what might have happened to you. Lucky if... thing I have good ears. My goodness, she might have died. Yes, she might have died. Go ahead. I'll be all right. I, I insist on it now. Go on. Go right now. Well, I uh, guess we'd better humor the patient. Uh, come on, folks. The taxi is waiting, and I'm sure dear Charlie will be good as new when we get back. All right. All right let's right. go. Hello? Hello, long distance. I want to speak to Mr. Jack Graham, Hotel California in Fresno. Oh, hurry, operator, please. It, it's urgent, so urgent. <laughs> Just a minute, folks. I'd like to propose a toast to our distinguished visitor who made the finest speech tonight ever heard in these parts. To Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I give you a toast to this beautiful village and its beautiful people. This haven, this place I would rather call home than any place in the world. The place I intend to... Charlie, my child, you're white as a ghost. I'm all right, Mother. I'm sorry, Uncle Charlie. You were saying that you'd rather live here than any other place in the world. And yet you must leave. You must leave tomorrow. Forever. Oh, all right, oh, fine. Oh, Charlie, you let the cat out of the bag, I was saving the bad news until last. I I didn't want to spoil your fun, Emmy, dear, but I got a letter today. I have to leave on the early morning train for San Francisco. Oh, no, Charles. But, uh, no. I'm, I'm going to miss you, Emmy. I'm going to miss you all. The train is going to start and I'll have to get off, Uncle Charlie. But I wanted to tell you, Jack Graham is on this train, waiting for it to reach the next town, and then then he's arrested. My dear girl. Wait. You know what I know about you, don't you, Uncle Charlie? You're a murderer, Uncle Charlie, and you you tried to murder me. Wait, Charlie. Let go of me. Let go of me. You did a fine thing for your mother. You were right not to let her know. After all, she's not very strong. This train is really going. I, I don't think I can... Yes, it's really going. And now I'll open this vestibule door. Wait. Just a little faster. You're mad. You're a madman. Just a little faster. A little faster. I want to be sure this time, my dear. Let me go. Sure. Now, now there's another train coming the other way. You are still alive when you hit the tracks. Well, so long, Charlie. My twin. No, no, you can't. No, no, no. Charlie, hold on. We're heading into a curve. Jack, he, yes, he tried to push me. Yes. And then you called him. And he fell under that other train. Jack. My Uncle Charlie. He's gone. <laughs> Sometimes it may be difficult to tell whether or not a man is what he seems to be. But there is no mistaking the finer character of all who put unselfish service to others above their own personal interests. There is the young woman, perhaps a member of your own family, who steps forward to help fill today's most urgent need for student nurses. 
There is the young doctor who takes no leave between his war duties and his return to civilian practice. Each is serving in a cause that cannot be denied, the cause of human health. The House of Squibb has been serving in that cause for almost a century, carrying on an endless quest for perfection in the development, production, and testing of life-saving drugs and everyday health essentials. Exhaustive research behind every Squibb product assures its uniformity, purity, and efficacy. That's why the name Squibb appears on so many prescriptions your doctor writes. Why it pays to insist on Squibb quality when you're buying health essentials for your use at home. Always ask for Squibb, a name you can trust. Next Wednesday, another great picture. The House of Squibb will present Academy Awards starring Irene Dunn in The White Cliffs of Dover. Today's performance of Shadow of a Doubt was written for radio by Frank Wilson with an original musical score composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Our producer-director is D. Engelbach. Joseph Cotton is soon to be seen in a David O. Selznick Technicolor production, Duel in the Sun. June Vincent may currently be seen in the Universal International production, Black Angel. This is Hugh Brundage bidding you good night until next Wednesday at the same time when you're invited to listen again to Academy Award, presented by the House at Squibb, a name you can trust. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening to that episode. If you would like to listen to more Academy Award, please visit otrpodcast.com. That's OTR for old time radio and podcast with an S. otrpodcast.com. On the website, you can register for my mailing list, and as a thank you, I will send you the links to more than 14 podcasts, each featuring every available episode of a popular radio program. In addition, I'll send out an email each week as I release a new episode of this podcast so that you never miss a single one. If you have enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to subscribe and give it a five-star rating and review in your podcast app. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. As always, thanks for tuning in.